Good morning and welcome to our webinar. Um, we are uh, here to present the All Market Report that was published just this morning. Uh, I'm here with the team uh, who put the report together. As usual, we will go uh, through the key findings of the report for about 20 minutes, and then we will allow plenty of time for questions. Uh, so please uh, put your questions in the Q&A uh, function on the Zoom as you think of them. Uh, in an update, in a change from, from our regular um, webinars, this time around, we have uh, invited press uh, to, to join the webinar due to the high demand for comments. Uh, but um, when we take the questions, they will be uh, anonymous. So do not hesitate to put questions uh, as you think of them. So without uh, further delay, we will just uh, move on to the, pr the presentation. And of course, as as you are aware, prices have come down sharply over the past week or two. Uh, and now, uh, yesterday, um, Brent trading below $70, the lowest is near, in nearly th three years. Obviously, the concern of the market is, is on a weaker demand in China and globally, but also the, the market uh, focus shifting from a relatively tight third quarter uh, with crude inventories drawing sharply into a more balanced uh, market in the fourth quarter and a looming oversupply potentially uh, in as we move to 2025. Uh, but without delay, I will pass over to my colleagues uh, on demand, uh, which is the focus, the main topic, the key topic of the report in this month. So, Kieran? Thanks, Toro. So, as we just heard, the key story on demand and one of the key stories for the market at the moment is that we see clear evidence that oil demand growth is slowing down. And you can see in this chart that during the, sec during the second half of 2023 and the first half of 2024, we've seen a real slowdown in demand growth, especially in China. And now with 80% of the data in, reported data from governments, we see that first half deliveries this year grew by about 800,000 barrels a day. That's close to what we initially forecast, and it aligns with a projection of about a 900 kBD growth for 2024 as a whole. We see that carrying forward into 2025 with 950 kBD of growth, so two years of less than 1 million, just under 1% growth each year for the oil markets. And the key factor there is the slowdown in China demand growth. So as Toro said, this has been a, a big issue for markets. According to our estimates in July, which is the latest fully reported month, we see 280 KBD fall year on year in Chinese demand, and that's the fourth straight month of contractions. So moving on to a bit more of a focus on China, it's important to note here that the economic data for China is a big part of this story. So it's always difficult to estimate the true state of, of any major economy, including China, perhaps especially China. But we can see the economic data remains subdued. The problem is the housing market are having an impact on construction, but also on other sectors. Consumer confidence is weak. Um, and we really see this especially clearly, as you can see in the chart on the right-hand side here, in the key products for things like construction and industry, so manufacturing. Those are gas oil and the petrochemical feedstocks. And so that we have a, a, a substantial slowdown in both of those sectors into the first half of this year. And that takes total demand growth down to about 180 KBD for the year on average. Strikingly, that's almost exclusively driven by petrochemicals now. So that, that yellow bar is almost all of the net growth that we see this year. And all other Chinese growth, which is essentially most Chinese fuels, is going to be close to zero this year based on our present estimates. The other important point to make here is what's driving that slowdown in fuel demand isn't only about the economy, it's also about the successes of some of China's strategic investments in things like electric vehicles, trucks based on natural gas, and high-speed rail. And we think these are collectively subduing growth this year, and those are structural factors that are going to continue into the medium term. So all this means that this year, China now, will, we think, will narrowly lose its number one spot in demand growth to India, so 180 versus 200. And that's, that has some significant implications for the profile of demand growth, both now, next year, and also as we go beyond that. 
So if we're looking at the, his, the history of this, the history of demand growth over the last 10 or so years, globally, you can see that China has an enormous role, really the, the indispensable element here in, in oil demand growth. Roughly 60%, slightly more than 60%, in fact, of growth over the decade to 2023, it's about 6 million barrels a day came from China. Uh, the rest being distributed across other emerging markets, predominantly, especially in Asia. As we said, those these structural changes that we're seeing, the slowdown that's already underway, mean that it's difficult to see how this will continue in the present form. And indeed, in 24 and 25, we see a much more balanced growth picture, where China is still large and important, maybe even still the largest element here, but very similar in size to India and the rest of Asia collectively. And in terms of going beyond this year into next year and so on, this is really the, what we expect the landscape to begin to look like, that those other high potential emerging Asian economies will start to come to the fore and become increasingly important for oil demand growth. The other thing to flag here that I think is really important and helps to condition where we see demand today, but also where the outlook goes, is that OECD piece. So the OECD, it's not only contracting this year and in our view next year, but it's contracted in absolute terms since 2013. So there's very slim growth. And we've seen major pieces of the, the major components of that OECD, uh, the OECD group, essentially flat year on year since the pandemic and not recovering to previous levels. And an excellent example of this is US gasoline. And also it's a very important topic for the market at the moment. So maybe it's worth a, a few moments of of attention. Um, US gasoline alone is 9% of all global oil demand. So it, it, it's very important, it's done right, but also it's emblematic of some other changes. And what we saw in May was very strong reported demand. So the, the, the beginning of the driving season, the shoulder of the driving season with 3% year on year increase. Uh, in June data, that's flipped back to a contraction. So there may be some issues around timing or stock builds to, in the tertiary sector that, that influenced this number. But we can see the clear picture that there's a slow but steady decline underway in US gasoline during the first half. Five of the six months saw small contractions. Uh, this is in line with the fundamental assumptions we have about changes in the economy, changes in the way people use their cars, the way they their behavior, especially around working from home, which we think is, is worth maybe a few hundred, 500 KBD of demand destruction compared to pre-pandemic levels in the US, but also the way the vehicle fleet is changing. And the US vehicle miles traveled numbers produced by the Federal Highways Administration are quite useful here to understand those numbers. That's the chart on the right-hand side. You can see that in all three of the most recent months that there's reporting there, miles driven were pretty strong, comparable to pre-pandemic uh, levels, so roughly in line with the 2029 equivalents. Nevertheless, there's a substantial fall from those levels in gasoline consumed, about a 4% drop compared to pre-pandemic levels, about 0.6% year on year. And that's reflective of changes in the fleet, improving vehicle efficiency, especially over that time, and to a slightly lesser extent, the role of EVs, which is growing all the time in the US. And this isn't a uniquely American story. This isn't a uniquely gasoline story. It's something that's quite uh, typical of the OECD as a whole, and especially fuel demand. And you, you can see here on the chart on the left-hand side first that OECD demand as a whole is steady over the last few years and far below 2019 levels. There's about 2 million barrels a day below, below pre-pandemic levels. And there's really no sign of a, of a rapid recovery back, back to that state. Looking at how that's broken down regionally on the right-hand side where those changes are, you can see that it's, again, quite broadly distributed. Um, we've talked about the U.S. fuels, they're falling. Indeed, other uh, OECD American economies have seen falls in, in their consumption, notably Canada and Mexico. In Europe, there's lower demand, especially from industrial fuels, from petrochemicals. Uh, and in Japan, we see low demand across a, a range of different areas, especially, uh, especially those fuel sectors, but also in things like power generation. So overall, this, this gives a... a consistent downward picture. The one exception, um, which is interesting from a, a variety of respects, is this US feedstocks piece. And that's predominantly LPG and especially ethane, uh, produced locally in the US, which has grown very strongly as the boom in supply has 
has made those feedstocks available for local producers. If you exclude that piece, then the OEC demand fell by about 2.6 million barrels a day compared to its pre-pandemic levels. So we really see this as one of the key driving factors of the slowing oil demand growth and, and again, conditioning our expectations for where it can go in the years ahead. Um, with that note about how supply and demand are intrinsically interlinked, I'll pass over to Peg Mackey, my colleague who focuses on supply, to, to talk about that a little bit. Thanks. Thanks, Kieran. When we're looking at the supply outlook, the picture is very much dominated by non-OPEC plus America's producers, the United States, Brazil, Guyana, and Canada. This quartet is forecast to add around 1.1 million barrels a day this year and increase by a similar amount in 2025. On the face of it, that's more than enough to meet demand growth. Total non-OPEC plus growth reaches 1.5 million barrels a day this year and next. But as you can see in the middle bar, the gold, losses of roughly 800,000 barrels a day this year from the OPEC plus alliance due mostly to its extra supply cuts means that overall growth this year comes in at around 660,000 barrels a day. Global growth next year is forecast to accelerate to around 2.1 million barrels a day, and that would boost supply to a new annual high of 105 million barrels a day. Now that strong growth that we're seeing in from non-OPEC plus, along with supply curbs led by Saudi Arabia, have cut the bloc's market share to just 48% from more than half in 2022, and nearly 56% in 2016, when the alliance was set up. And the bloc's market share next year will shrink further if its existing cuts stay in place. And with that, I'll turn things over to my colleague, Dave Martin, to cover refining. Thank you, Peg. So on uh, refining, we've lowered our forecast to 83 million barrels a day for this year. So the chart on the left shows you that uh, year to date, we've been tracking uh, prior year levels, we think actually growth will accelerate in the second half of the year, uh, largely well, in part due to a, a weak baseline for last year. Uh, a lot of this weakness is driven by China. So the chart on the right shows you that actually uh, versus the uh, activity levels this year are uh, have weakened as we've gone through the year. And actually July was nearly a million barrels a day lower than where we were a year ago. Uh, but we still forecast in, in line with the, the demand forecast. We also forecast a recovery in the second half of the year to some extent. And then uh, some new capacity uh, boosts the 25 forecast, as you see there, towards 15 million barrels a day, but basically going back towards a, a level that's consistent with 2023. Uh, with China not leading growth this year, actually, it's places like the Middle East and Africa, start off in new refineries, which, which lead growth. OECD is broadly flat this year and then starts to contract as refineries shut down next year. Um, Part of the weakness in runs, of course, reflects the fact that margins have deteriorated. So if we look at the uh, left-hand chart here, cracking margins across the three uh, on enclaves we track, Europe, Singapore, and the US Gulf Coast, have come down, uh, notwithstanding the disruptions caused by the uh, cold weather in the US at the beginning of the year. Uh, margins have weakened. Gas, oil, uh, diesel, jet fuel, and gasoline cracks latterly have all weakened, and that's put margins under, under pressure. And indeed, in Singapore and in Europe, we saw cracking margins turn negative in, in late August. And even where we look at uh, a more robust environment where refiners on the Gulf Coast, if you look at the right-hand chart, uh, have got uh, advantage crude slates and, and lower feedstock and that gas costs, even here, refining margins are back down to three-year lows, uh, healthy but uh, or healthier, but still uh, much weaker than they have been uh, a year ago. And it's really this increased competition that we flag uh, between places like the US Gulf Coast for middle distillate exports to go to places like Europe, which are pressuring distillate cracks. Um, and with that, let me hand it over to Yuya. Thanks, David. Uh, just only one slide for stocks. Global observed inventories declined by 47 million barrels in July. Crude oil energy oils, feeder stocks led their decreases by four in 76 million barrels, while oil product built by 28 million barrels to their highest since January 2021. In second quarter of this year, global oil production rose by about 900 kbd uh, in one year, 
mostly in energy air supply that is boosting LPG stocks. By contrast, crude and other oil supply increases were less than refinery throughput growth that resulted in a huge stock draws. OECD industry stock fell counter seasonally by 12 million barrels in July, mainly OECD Europe. They remained 79 million barrels below their five year average. Crude oil, energy air, and feeder stocks inventories declined by 36 million barrels to their lowest since September last year. Total oil product stock built by 24 million barrels to their highest in three years. Preliminary, stock do uh, preliminary data show continued global stock declines in August, mainly in crude oil again. Then back to toil. Thank, thank you, Yuya. So, um, so just wrapping up, uh, as we heard uh, through the demand and, and supply and inventory um, presentations, we're seeing, uh, putting it all together, we're seeing here that the market is flipping from a relatively significant deficit in the third quarter, about 600,000 barrels a day. Uh, and as Yuya just mentioned, focus on the crude side of things uh, with product stocks and led by LPGs uh, growing in the recent months. But for the fourth quarter, we see a relatively balanced market, assuming uh, that Libyan production does recover from, from current lows and, and on the basis if the, if the current uh, voluntary cuts uh, stay in place. Uh, and for moving on to 2025, we see there that the market is faced by a significant oversupply, even if OPEC uh, production cuts remain in place of about a million barrels a day. So uh, with that, we will end our presentation today. Uh, we will uh, take about a minute's break uh, to wait till questions come in. Uh, so please um, put us in the Q&A and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. <laughs>